outperform trial and error intellectually, you need at least a thousand IQ points. <laughs> Which, which I mean, I'm sure you know you're close, but, but, but even that you get, get that that high. I mean, if a few uh, people. I mean, nobody nobody you know gets uh, close to a fraction of that. Anyway, so you realize that uh, that's uh, the, 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 my main idea when I say that you'd rather be anti-fragile than intelligent any time. And you look at the data, and you realize that all the big gains we have had in any field, almost any field, except the nuclear came from trial and error by people who didn't have much of a clue about the process. There's something technical I want to mention here about there's a domain that's purely anti-fragile benefits, it's the entrepreneurship. Okay, and I was calling for National Entrepreneur Day. Why? Because, you know, as you're saying, losing a little bit of money all the time to make big gains isn't part of human nature, except in California it is where well, it's respectable to fail. They say fail early, so you can fail seven times before you're a big thing. So collectively, you have thousands of people failing for everyone succeeding, and the person succeeding also ha have, has failed probably seven or eight times before. Okay? So they deal with failure, but they have small upside. But how do they do it? One, they made it respectable, and I want to make it more respectable. But there's a mathematical property that's quite shocking that, that came out from options I realized. And I call it the philosopher's stone. And, and, I, and no, no, nobody's getting the following, that trial and error isn't really trial and error. Trial and error is trial with small error. If you have small error and big upside, what is anti-fragile has small losses, big gains. So trial and error has to have small losses, big gains. So if you model it, you realize that to outperform trial and error intellectually, you need at least 1,000 IQ points. <laughs> Which, which I mean, I'm sure you know, you're close, but, but, but even that you get that that high. I mean, if a few uh, people. I mean, nobody, nobody, you know, gets uh, close to a fraction of that. Anyway, so you realize that uh, that's uh, the, the my main idea when I say that you'd rather be anti-fragile than intelligent any time. And you look at the data, and you realize that all the big gains we have had in any field, almost any field, except the nuclear and even in medicine, except for AZT drugs, came from trial and error by people who didn't have much of a clue about the process. Just trying. You, you try, you discover, you're rational enough to know that what you found is better than we had before. So this, this is where, and, and in this Fat Tony story, Fat Tony, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm just I'm like talking to a shrink, I realize there's a Fat Tony in me. Fat Tony was, was a sad character. I didn't know I was Fat Tony, but now I realize that I am you Fat were. Tony. I'm Fat Tony <laughs> half the day, <laughs> right, half probably the half the day now. All right. Now things come out, you know, in these conversations. Watch out when you talk publicly with a uh, psychologist next time. Uh, so the, the Fat Tony, well, whether I got this idea of Fat Tony from Nietzsche. I don't know if you've heard of creative, the notion of creative destruction, but it's a Nietzsche. Nietzsche has Dionysus, the Dionysian in us, and he has the Apollonian. The Apollonian likes order, knowledge, serenity, uh, harmony, uh, and of course, uh, uh, predictability, and, and see things. And there's that dark force that hard to understand, the, uh, the, the Dionysian, right? And Innes, and, and then there's, he, he found that, you, that the, when the, the balance got disrupted with Socrates. So Fat Tony goes to argue with Socrates. So there's a two-pole. Fat Tony, who doesn't believe in knowledge, he believes in tricks and no theory. He believes in doing, and you try to keep trying until something works, and you get rich, and then you go have lunch, and this is why he's called Fat Tony. He has a lot of, a lot of meals. So he's, he's arguing with Socrates, <laughs> and then he was able to express that sentence that Nietzsche, Nietzsche really understood. He said, the mistake people tend to make is to think that whatever you don't understand is stupid. That was Fat Tony. They say the unintelligible is not necessarily unintelligent. And anti-fragility is harvesting the unintelligible, is harvesting what we don't understand. And this is what we've done. Take the Industrial Revolution, take California, you know, the, uh, the Silicon Valley, take in medicine the discoveries, is harvesting the unintelligible with small errors and big gains and doing it in an industrial scale. And the problem with education, that's the only really thing I don't like about academia, is one, had we put Bill Gates through an entire you know, college experience, we wouldn't have had Microsoft, right? 
Okay? So the problem is the Industrial Revolution happened with people who weren't really academics. And once we got there, then they wanted the state you know, to create uh, you know, invention from top down, not bottom up. That's the problem. Education inhibits risk taking. That's my only po point. I'm going to simulate a process here. This is not in a book, by the way. All right? This is outside the book. Simulate the process where you have two people competing. One person has knowledge, and his brother has, um, has uh, convexity, has a convex payoff. Look at, and the difference between them would be the difference between knowledge and a convex payoff will be what I call the convexity bias. I simulated it, and look how big it is. Well, visibly, this explains something <laughs> that people so far couldn't understand. You know, trial and error, okay, has errors in it, do you agree? So in, in, in history books, a history of technology, people usually oppose trial and error versus theoretical knowledge. But they never were able to work with trial and error. They didn't understand it was, had to be convex. Trial and error relies on luck, but luck can hurt you. So it was never modeled as an option. Technology as an option. If it's modeled as an option, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions, so I'll, leave, I'll, I'll go over this uh, very quickly. If I were to model it as an option, trial and error, then it would, have, it would be something that loves volatility. You see? Option loves volatility. And you, you can have policies that come from it. My idea of Flanner is very simple. When, I'd much rather have series of options, like have a long highway with a lot of exits, then be locked in into top-down plan like a highway with no exits. A destination, you exit. That's it. So assume you want to change your mind, you're in trouble, OK? Particularly if you don't know Russian and you're in Russia, right? That's how they build their thing. So, the, 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 so you have two approaches to knowledge. One is top-down, and one is bottom-up. So here there are about 75 pages that should upset a lot of academics because you take, I, I took some you know, uh, evidence which includes my own field, which was to be derivatives, that a lot of things that we think we believe come from top-down knowledge and theoretical knowledge effectively come from tinkering. Dressed up later as having been developed by a theoretician, which includes these corners up here. Euclid, people say you have to learn Euclidean geometry. And look at all these things that were built after Euclid, all right, for about 15th, 16th century. People were building things that never heard who Euclid was. All right? The Romans were extremely heuristic, very, very, very um, experience-based. And they did everything using this convex knowledge. How is convex knowledge? It's exactly like cooking. You have very little to lose by adding an ingredient and tasting. All right? If it works, now you have a better recipe. If it fails, you lost nothing. So things in knowledge. No, no academic would want to, ex I mean, I'm a professor in an engineering department. N no academic, except engineers, because they're nice people, no academic would accept the notion that knowledge can come from uh, uh, bottom up, uh, you know. So we have evidence of what I call lecturing birds how to fly. A lot of science comes from technology. But look at the definition, Google technology science, and we explain that technology is application of science to practical things, exactly opposite. Anyway, so this is my, my option theory thing. I don't know if it upset many of you, but typically it upsets academic. Yeah, I mean, it, it feels like there's a lot of people who want to, you know, who have a point on the map that they want to get to, and then they have to figure out how to get to there. But really, everyone should just move from where they are today, right? The t I think that's what's so important about the tinkering well, thing is it's well, very incremental. Yeah, exactly. All, all three of us up here are tinkerers. Like, I, you know, was early on tinkering with Twitter for philosophy. Um, you know, you, Sahil, you're tinkering with Gumroad in like the weird way that you run it. Uh, you're tinkering on the crowdfunding side. You were tinkering on rolling funds. I was tinkering on how to mechanize angel investing in VC. I was kind of opening things up with the blogs on venture hacks, and that was tinkering. Ben, you were tinkering on stratechery and dithering. Like, we're tinkerers, right? And I think most successful creators are ultimately tinkerers. They're just kind of playing around at the edges of their field on something that is interesting to them. It's not really with some strong motive. It's play. It's not really with a motive to like create something great out of it. It's because they're they're genuinely interested. And most tinkering is wasted. It's like when your kids are playing, most of that time is you know quote unquote wasted. But once in a while, it will result in something which for a child might be a hobby, 
and for an adult, it might be a vocation. Yeah, I think it's also inherently low status, right? I think you 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 kind of spend years not making any money and maybe not building an audience and getting really good at a skill, but you don't have any 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 way to know if you know if that's actually going to turn into anything. Uh, the sort of turning into something is you know kind of happens all at once ten years later. Well, I think there's something too about learning how to be in your particular moment, and people get so fixed. Well, five, 10 years in the future, particularly when it comes to the career. And the real danger is you end up like succeeding and then you ended up in a place that's just not very relevant or interesting, or there's a ton of competition. And I look back like how I ended up what I'm doing. And God said they had the quote, you know, you look backwards, you connect the dots. Learning. I was, you know, maximizing whatever I was doing at that particular time. That's what pays off. And you see so many people get so distracted about where they want to go. And they don't take full advantage of the spot that they're in. And then you look back and like, man, I wish I would have spent that time better because I could have really used that experience and it's already, it's already too late. You certainly don't want to plan for trying to predict too much in the future. Like, I think the worst title you can possibly have in your bio is futurist. First of all, it's just tone deaf. But when someone says futurist and it's like, ah, uh, you know, they're trying too hard. They're trying too hard to live in the future when, yes, you're right. Your only moment of power and knowledge is the present. You just act from the present. Um, and it's not to say you shouldn't have like goals and plans and those kinds of things. It's kind of nice to have them loosely held. But if you stick too closely to them, you'll miss reality. Reality is very fluid and very complex. And it's much more about navigating from the small set of options presented to you, much more choose your own adventure style than you know top down Soviet style planning with five year plans and I'm gonna to get to A then B then C. You no, know, I think the other thing with that too, you do need a long term goal, but that gives you a way to think about the immediate term options, right? Like so I have three options today that are not my long term goal. I know the general direction I'm going. So I can choose this one that maybe is suboptimal or maybe seems further but I'm building up a particular skill or getting a particular sort of experience that will get me closer to that long-term goal without having, yeah, like a five-year plan. I think that, that's the exact, like, the exact wrong way to go about it. Well, I, I think it's, it's what's so difficult when, you, when someone asks someone who's successful, like, why did you become successful? And it basically forces, I feel like, the person to lie because <laughs> you, you look back, connect the dots, and then you can't help but sort of believe that it, was, it sort of happened on purpose and that you sort of had you know, you, you can't remember what it was like to not know where you were going. Yeah, first I picked sperm number 3,768,412 that then routed its way to egg number 14 on the exact date of blah, blah, blah. Right? No, so well, it's funny. Begins. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, no, I, I, it was funny. I told this story on, on this week's Exponent exactly where it's hilarious that I'm known as the newsletter guy. I, it was a total accident. Where I had the, I had the vision to have a subscription base, one was all website centric, and it was a total disaster. And I, I actually launched it on a Thursday. It was a total mess. I tore it all over the weekend. I told people like, look, I just screwed up the website style for anyone that's not a subscriber. I, it's the wrong direction. I'm just going to email you. If you subscribe, I'll email you additional stuff in addition to the website. <laughs> like literally like a spur of the moment i have to fix this problem figure it out how am i going to get content to my subscribers without having a bad experience for non-subscribers and then now today i'm the newsletter guy it's like so there when you look backwards if you're actually honest about it there's a lot of luck for sure and a lot of like just in the right but, but the way, moment take the right choice it's, it's funny angelus has a similar story because uh first there was a network for sharing deal flow that nivi and i built or mostly nivi built called the pound deal flow network it's literally a little social network with a feed and you could follow people and nobody used it and then he built a google group and nobody used that either and then finally we're like screw it we're this none of this is working just freaking email them <laughs> the data and that was angel list what fools call wasting time is most often the best investment nasim taleb from the bed of proscrustes you can't connect the dots looking forward you can only connect them looking backwards steve jobs ideas don't come out fully formed they only become clear as you work on them you just have to get started mark zuckerberg now i want to share some of my thoughts in my perspective the theoretical knowledge is important to have a minimum of good judgment 
to know more or less what path to take and also detect the BS and nonsense that exists in most industries, especially important in new emerging and still to fully regulate industries, because this will have lots of scams around. As you acquire these foundational axioms, what Elon Musk would call first principle thinking, you will be ready to follow the path or paths that you want. In that path, you execute through trial and error and learn from the errors and implement that new knowledge into your previous knowledge base. So I think the theoretical knowledge is useful for having a first principles thinking base and a minimum understanding necessary for a given activity, but then all real and innovative learning will come from the bottom up knowledge. From the outcomes of an iteration, you learn and rationally decide to move one way or the other. Just like Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger spend most of their days thinking and reading and inevitably learning from theoretical knowledge, all their investment decisions to action, that is the execution part, are absolutely opportunistic and they keep learning from each mistaken decision. The key, I think, is to never stop learning from either theoretical knowledge or tinkering. Because just like compounding in investments, knowledge does also compounds and we are never too wise at anything, in absolute terms. As Charlie Munger says, develop into a lifelong self-learner through voracious reading, cultivate curiosity and strive to become a little wiser every day. Would you like to get access to the finest nuggets from the best non-fiction books out there? If you do, you should check out Shortform. For disclosure, Shortform is not sponsoring this video, but there is an affiliate link in the video description. Why am I promoting Shortform? Well, my purpose through this channel is to collect valuable insights from videos of people that I deeply admire. Now imagine if you can easily get the most valuable insights from the best nonfiction books. This is what you can find on Shortform a curated selection of the best books and for each book you can find a carefully crafted summary in which all the book's relevant ideas are analyzed. This is why I absolutely love to read on Shortform and would recommend it to anyone. As Charlie Munger argues, to have a good and successful life you have to create a mental model from all the big ideas from all the big disciplines. And Shortform can be extremely helpful for this matter as it literally extracts all the big ideas from the best non-fiction books helping you to create this mental model in a faster and more efficient way. And with these valuable ideas becoming second nature to us over time, I think we will be able to build our best lives by standing on the shoulders of giants, as Sir Isaac Newton would put it. Now the way I personally read on short form is to pick from my personal library any book that sparks my interest at that moment and start reading it. Typically I will read sometimes in the morning after waking up, sometimes at night before going to sleep, and many times I will do a short read on the mobile phone app when for instance I'm in a restaurant alone waiting for the food or commuting somewhere. I created my personal library by quickly scan through all the books on short form, and for any book to make it on my library it has not only to interest me but it also must fulfill at least one of two conditions. One is that I already know the author of the book from an interview in some podcast or any other source that I personally trust. And the other is that the book itself has been publicly recommended by people who I deeply admire. If you are interested in short form, you can visit my special link shortform.com slash picking nuggets. I will also leave the link in the description of the video. By joining with my affiliate link, you will be supporting this channel and you can have unlimited access for five days and a 20% discount on the annual subscription if you do choose to keep going after the end of your trial. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy the written content in this video, you will love our newsletter, where you can get in your email all the written content plus the latest things that I've been pondering. To subscribe, always for free, find the link below in the description.